have a hope and his name is Jesus. Death has no power for he
together in secret our hope had been lost the great king who would lead them had been nailed to a cross but after three concerning the book of life but then we're going to look at some other things this morning as we would look at what God has in his plan for you and I from the foundation of the world before even angels, planets anything was created God had us in mind and he wrote our names in his book Now, there's no physical book in heaven, but it's written on the mind of God, really. Because there's no tangible paper that you can bring up there, no tangible scroll that you can have there. And to everyone that's in that book of life, your name is in that scroll. That's wonderful. And looking at the things just because of things that have been developing in the last little while. The book of life is the same thing as the Lamb's book of life. The only difference is in the terminology is when back here before Jesus came they couldn't call it the Lamb's book of life. Because the Lamb had not come. Now they say we say it's the Lamb's book of life, but actually it's God's book. He's the one that puts everyone that's going to have eternal life. He's the source. He's that tree of life. He's all in all, praise the Lord. And to bring this all home is we all have one Father. One Father. So therefore, yes, that book of life. Oh, wrong one. That book of life. So don't get confused by saying, well, I think there's another book or there's different accounts. We have to look at the origin. God, from the foundation of the world, wrote your my name in his book or in his memory. And even before man or the angel stepped on the scene, God, in his infinite plan, was looking to have fellowship. And the first family he creates is the angelic beings. And he could talk to the angels, and the angels could talk back to him, and they lived in the spirit world. But although they were mightier, wonderful creations of God yet in the bosom of God if I can put it this way while he was planning it out in his planning room there was yet something missing he couldn't heal an angel he couldn't save an angel and that's a quality that we find in God's children 
Not that we can heal, but we love to pray for someone to be healed. We love to have fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And when we get into trouble, we cry out to Him. And He loves it. Yes, He does. Because He wants to play a part too that I can help my family that I've created. And so before the foundation of the world, God knew that man, yes, man would sin and fall away. But in His plan, He wanted to bring a Redeemer, which is none other but the Lord Jesus Christ. That in the fullness of time, He would come and He would die for the sins of the whole world. Past, present, future from His time when He was here on earth. Isn't that wonderful? But in there, there's other things that are involved as we were going to look into certain things this morning. How wonderful when He did create man. Adam was created in the spirit world on the sixth creative day. And I know I've said this before, but it's good for you to hear it again. Can you picture yourself? Here he is being created. And when he was created, the angels wanted to see what God was doing. And when he wanted to, so that he could have the angels on board, that they could assist him in working with man. There's nothing worse, worse than working on something you don't know nothing about. And so when God said, let us make man, he wasn't talking about the second or third person. He was talking about the angelic family. Because those Trinitarians that try to bring it down that way, that this, their father, there was the three of them there. We all have one father. Not two different fathers or three different fathers. One. One spirit that gives life. One tree of life. He's the source. He's the one that makes you and I alive. I feel good. Praise the Lord. The devil was beating me before I came this morning. Oh, he says, just, you've got something just five minutes and you know how he's going to go. We all have battles. But if we stand still and let God work it out, you never know how he can use you. Whether in testimony or whatever God may have for you to do. It may be a song. It may be you praying for someone. It may be a testimony. But all in all, it edif everything edifies the body of Christ. So Adam has been there for over a thousand years. Now remember, God rested on the seventh day, not 24 hours, but there are a thousand years period of time. Can you imagine all the Understanding he could accumulate in there. He could see when the animals were being created. He could see when the planet was being restored. Uh, being in, in his restored uh, place on that sixth day. So he had a thousand years to look at how plants grow and things like that. So when God did finally put him on the earth... He was not a turnip or a vegetable. He had that instilled in him. But God couldn't leave him in the spirit world. Because if he did, he'd be like the angels. So God made him man that a little lower than the angels. That he put him in a body that he could die. God's purpose, yes... In the expression as he raised the family, he's not willing that man wanted to die, but gave man the freedom of choice. And you and I have freedom of choice this morning. You have a choice to be here or to spend some time in, in luxury or not luxury, but in entertainment in the world and not be here. But the true child of God, he has a hunger. He wants to know what my Heavenly Father would have for me today. Eagles are a hungry bunch. 
They need food. And if you feed them crackers all the time, they get a little edgy. They start to squawk. What's going on? <laughs> right? But I'm thankful there's plenty of in store in God's storehouse. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole story of the creation this morning. But I'm looking at something as God now puts man on the earth and he does sin. Yeah, maybe I can bring that in too. In that Garden of Eden, and what made it a garden was the presence of God on it. Man had a, he was in the spirit world when God created him, but when God put him on earth in a body, and he took the woman out of man, they could see in a natural world, and they could see in the spirit world. They had access to both. But God put two trees in the garden. Now there we go, trees. Are my own apple, oranges, peaches, pears, you know, plums? No. They weren't the natural type of trees. They, they, a tree is something that gives source, that gives life. You see, brings branches and does bring fruit on it. Well, God put two laws in which man would be governed, that he put it before him that man could partake, if he wanted to, one or the other. But God says, it was best that they would take partake of the tree of life. But then there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now what is that tree of knowledge of good and evil? It's the intelligence that's in man that's influenced by the source of Satan in it. And Satan can use man's intelligence to look at things and have a certain ideas and looks and looks towards God, this should be what should be. Now when Adam sinned, he knew right off the bat that when they, after what they've done, in their conscience he knew something was wrong. God didn't tell them, have to tell them, now you go sell, sow yourself some fig leaves. And he didn't put the fig leaves over his head, over his mouth, but over the parts of reproduction that, he, that they were there. And they hid themselves. That shows their conscience was pricked. You don't go hiding yourself if you're not guilty. But if you're guilty, you don't want to stick around where you can be exposed. So God came around to Adam and Eve. Where art thou, Adam? <laughs> I have a little bit. Well, uh, we, we thought we, we had this idea to cover ourselves because maybe, uh, you know, we should be covered. Well, God could read right through it. You partook of the wrong tree. Yes, there was the act, but they partook of the spirit of knowledge of good and evil. Now that knowledge, in that knowledge tree of knowledge of good and evil, it knows what's good and it can know what's evil, wrong. As far as the things that we do on the earth physically. But the source that influences it. It can influence a tear to do good up to a point. But no, no life in it. Or it can influence a man of the world. Be a, a, a sinner. A, a whatever. Just like what I heard this morning on, on the news. How they, they had one of those pressure cooker bombs. That they kill people. You can use it for evil. It's not God that inspires that. That's Satan. That's that source. Now, the God wanted man to have eat from the source of the tree of life, which is his spirit. Now, when I say man should eat of the tree of life, Eve, we should ask the Lord what we're going to make for supper. That's not in that realm. But when it comes something when God directs his word. He told him, don't partake of that tree till the time's right. And that's for actually the family tree. So God knows. But Adam, 
was not deceived. Eve was. And, and isn't that the way of the devil? He'll come around and bring something around and nag you till you get to change your mind. That's what the serpent did to Eve. It was not done in ten minutes. It might have took a number of years, because remember, they just come out of the spirit world and they knew what God was and they had access to the spirit world. But he planted an idea from the source through the intelligence that God had placed in man that maybe God's not all right, maybe it might be, this may be okay, and you won't die. So in time, that old serpent works on, on Eve. And that's sometimes like the devil will, uh, works on us. Till you fall in something and you say, whoa, your conscience says, hey, you've done wrong. But to you and I in this hour, we ought to be wa walking right. But we have an advocate and a high priest, praise the Lord. Yes, we come from that fallen nature. It's a struggle to keep that old man in, in check. How many finds it the breeze to do that? Okay, I, I, I just was wondering in case you, what, what you're thinking. No, it's not a breeze. But when you're born again, there's that Spirit of God will start speaking to you, and it brings a certain joy in it. I'll oh, praise God. So now, God exposes them. And what does God do? He kills an animal. Now these act animal activists. God, you shouldn't have started that. You know what happens after that. They're going to start killing animals and so far and further down. It's you that showed the way. That's how some would think that's not even Christians. But God had to slay an animal because God's laws was for sin, something had to die. And so therefore, God in slaying the animal in his provision... It was not the perfect way for him because one day he would have that perfect situation. That that blood would cover their sins and would be remitted from year to year going down through time. And so lo and behold, out of the relationship with Eve and the serpent and Adam, two sons were born. And I don't think that Adam had his sin covered just by the anim one animal that God killed, I believe he knew that whenever he'd done wrong, now that he's fallen, has a fallen nature, has sinned, now he from, not saying he's going to be sitting every day and killing a whole lot of animals, but somewhere it's reading between the line, Adam would have done that to show to God, I've done wrong, it takes that sacrifice for me. And so while the two boys, Cain and Abel, were growing up, didn't Adam didn't say, now you get away from here because uh, this is only for me and Eve. No, they saw what their father was doing. And they would see that till the age when they would get... Uh, just Now, if I say a date or a number, people get going gets hairy with that. But I'm just expressing a thought this morning. So let's say they reach around the age, what we call today, 20, being an adult, coming into adulthood. So now it was time for them to stand on their own, not just the, what their father was doing for them, but now they're on their own, and they have to, God is requiring them, wants them, because they knew they didn't have too much corruption in the days of Adam and Eve. There was just that thing that took place in the garden. And so... We can see that Abel was tapped into the tree of life. That he took a blood sacrifice. And God honored it because God honored what his word was requiring. But now Cain. Instead of using the inspiration from the tree of life. His he gets inspiration from the other tree and inspiration. Look. I can do something wonderful for the Lord. I, I can make a prettier op, uh, uh, altar than, than Abel. 
and I can dress it up, and the Lord, and his, he's using his own reasoning and intelligence, and inside I can see, he felt joy, oh, I'm going to do something for God. Well, doing something for God, you better know that it's the Spirit of God that's leading you. Because Satan is very well equipped to get you joyed, get your mind thinking and using just your mind to look at something to make it so pretty to offer it to the Lord. And Cain, when his sacrifice were refused by God, he got really put out. He got jealous of his brother. I don't think it's the same day that it took that it happened the first time. But somewhere, Cain went and killed his brother because of jealousy. He wanted to be respected. In other words, instead of him changing his revelation, he goes further into darkness. And that's what false revelation will do. Doesn't matter whether it was in the Garden of Eden or what's happening in our day today. So now, getting ahead of myself a little bit, we're going to look at something this morning. So when Adam and Eve sin, and we want to go to Genesis this morning, chapter 3, Starting at verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he puts forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God was more or less expressing. Now God knows what evil is, and He knows what good is. But God does not cre does not does not do evil. He knows about it, but He lives from the source. Well, God is life to begin with, anyway. That's not the point I want to get at. But a little further down in verse twenty-four. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Wow. Men, we have to work. You can't have a slave and sit on the lazy boy chair and everything's done for you. It would be wonderful. But because man sinned, man has to toil for a living. And so God, verse 24, and so he drove the man, he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim's plural. Cherubim's plural. And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In other words, God placed cherubim's plural. I have a crude picture. I couldn't. I had to make something. I couldn't find anything. So, let's see where I got it here. Adam, where art thou? <laughs> okay, here. Okay, don't. I uh, shouldn't do that. So. God placed cherubims. How many were there? It doesn't tell you. But it tells you they were to keep the way from getting to the tree of life or the source. And he put a flaming sword to stop man. It's just all it's saying God used cherubims that would stop man from having access to the source of God in the spirit world. 
Now, I was reading, and I just happened to come across something Brother Brian was saying. He says, these cherubims, it says it was and the cherubims and the flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Not one way, every way. So that's plural, isn't it? And so therefore these cherubims were like guards, if you want to. And he expresses as there being four cherubims that guards, in one sense, using from a natural illustration, anything that would come from the north, the east, the west, or the south. Or means from any direction what it means. And these four cherubims are the same four cherubims later on, much later on in, his, in the days of Ezekiel that Ezekiel now sees in that vision. Because as man would try to reach towards the throne of God, well, there was no physical throne at that point in time because it was a vision that was future was going to roll on further. But these four, there is four cherubims that blocks the access to the Spirit of God. All right? Well, just, we're just looking at it this morning. And here, they are not placed with swords now. But the function is still the same. They are the next step before anything can go up any further to where the, the tree of life where God is at. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 6, there's four cherubims there. Yes, we know that those four cherubims is related to the, the counter to the four horse riders. But it is also, they are right about the throne, blocking the access, the man, to that throne. And as they block their access to the throne, they're not pictured there with swords anymore. Because man's not coming out of a Garden of Eden anymore. But these four cherubims is the protection from having access to the throne. And Satan, with those horse riders, influencing men during the Grace Age, tried to interpret what the scripture was to have access to God. But these four cherubims blocks it off and it's only access to the children of God. Now they were there as function to stop it. And they'll stop anything coming through the throne except Jesus Christ that sits on the throne. Anything that comes through Jesus Christ has access to the throne of God. So man, doesn't matter where it was in the, from the garden, date of innocence, date of law, or even in this hour. Man from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, cannot access because those cherubims that was in the garden, although they, they changed, well, it's the way it was pictured then in, in, the, in Genesis, showing they were keeping the way to what? To the tree of life. Well, who's the tree of life? Didn't Jesus say, I am the life, the way, and the truth, and so forth? Truth to who? To the Heavenly Father that is that tree. Doesn't that make sense? To, it made a whole lot of sense to me. I don't know about you. You don't have to accept what I'm saying this morning, but praise God to me that makes... I can see the picture as it moved on. From there, those four cherubims. Now as man has moved on, it's seen in the vision of Ezekiel. And remember in Ezekiel, they were seen with the wheels in the middle of the wheel showing revelation was in motion still. But John sees it in 96 AD. He sees those four. Now, don't be confused if I say cherubim. The cherubims, the living creatures, are the same ones. 
Because there was four living creatures, and he expressed it in one way, in the book of Revelation. But they are cherubims. And the picture is beautiful. <laughs> so it doesn't matter whether you had reasoning in the days of Adam. You couldn't go through the tree of knowledge good and evil of your own intelligence to reach God. God, in other words, God blocks off the revelation of the true revelation that a child of God can have. But the seed of the serpent, they are closed off to that access to that throne to the access to the tree of life because they are trying to go through that tree of knowledge, good and evil, through intelligence, through reasoning, through studying things. They may feel good. They feel energized. They'll probably have a, a revelation that's closer to you they have even today. But they're not going by the source through Christ to that tree of life. And those cherubims are much more powerful than itty bitty little old man that we try to bring out of a, of a revelation. If God has sent those angels to stop fallen mankind that would not have their names in the book of life, to have access to the throne through the revelation of it, and the spirit that comes with the word of God for that revelation. Now, when we say revelation, oh, but there's some that has just as much revelation as you do, but they've gone off, they've gone on to different things. They have it from the mind. But if you're born again, that spirit comes with that word. The words that I speak, Jesus said, they are spirit and they are life. Oh, the Baptists or the Methodists can say, oh, we believe that. They're believing it from their mind. But when it comes, when the Spirit bears witness to that word, then it becomes truth. We grow from grace to grace, from, from, from truth to truth, line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here, a little there. Ain't that wonderful? Can you see that? To me, when I, when I seen him say that, I said, there's something about God's Word that will click in and the Spirit will bear witness. There's the picture. And the picture fits. Well, praise the Lord. There's more. Maybe I should finish here for this morning. All right. I, 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 Sometimes I like to tease. but So now that we see that those cherubims they're seen into the picture till the grace age is over. But when the grace age is over, and we come with the Lord Jesus Christ to rule and reign on this earth. Everything that's here in heaven don't remain in heaven. It's coming to the earth. Jesus is going to rule and reign in that temple in Jerusalem. The Spirit of the Father doesn't stay up there. He'll still be in and through His Son in that eternal age. And the price He paid on Calvary also pays for the sheep's because the sheep can't have eternal life from that source except a price was paid. Because remember, those sheep are still part of the family that man was created. Because sometimes I can see we're wondering, well, they're not born again. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't get... God has a provision for them. If he could give white robes to the souls under the altar... And those that died in the tribulation that don't know the revelation of God of this hour to the foolish virgins or even in, during the grace age those that were only come up to a certain part where they had not come to the full uh, requirement for their time in their age they're given white robes. And then we can go back to the Old Testament. 
Yeah. They didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. So what gives them access to the throne? Or access to the tree of life? To those in the age of innocence, in the age of the law, although they didn't have the spirit, the born-again spirit, as they would at least accept what God's word said and wanted to live by it, God honored it, and we can't tell God, now wait a minute, they didn't come through Jesus Christ, you can't give them white robe. God gives white robes to whom he wants. And they're found in the paradise part of hell after Jesus' resurrection. And he goes and tells them those things that you were required to offer an animal sacrifice for your sins. That was being, it was being remitted from year to year. He was there to tell them, I have fulfilled the actual thing and am the perfect sacrifice that God will accept. And because of that, now you ain't staying in the paradise part of hell. You're going to be going up in glory where I'm going after his resurrection. Praise the Lord. So we can't limit God to, oh, everybody's got to accept Jesus Christ. No. It's wonderful. Yes, in our time, it's needful. All right. So now we've come with the Lord Jesus Christ, a rule and reign in that millennium. And when we come down, because the reason I was saying a while ago that picture you've seen, now it's just a picture. Uh, don't, when you, we pass on before the week, before that ha- happens, don't expect to see it all there, this over here, and just like the picture Brother Fred put on the screen. No, they're there in the spirit realm. But it says in Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, all the saints are coming with him. Those that have passed from death to life that has a resurrected body in heaven are all coming down to the earth. The bride is the one that the Lord allows to be made visible. But all the white robes, He's going to use them at the opening of the millennium when He divides the sheep from the goats. And He'll say to those that were martyred for the Word of God or for the testimony of Jesus Christ, Come here. You were a witness to these here. These, this one was a goat, and this one was a sheep. He brings the resurrected ones that live at that hour as a witness to them. And so in their own order, the, it brings about their... That's why we see the scripture that, that our precious brother Jackson brought about, that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It was not a race. It's just that God took those that were last... It's needful for, to judge the sheep and the goat at the opening of that millennium. That's why they're the last are first. Not because they were better or they had more of the Holy Ghost or had better revelation. It's because of the period of time they were in. But now that we are in the millennium, Here we are. Now I touched something here last uh, Thursday night. We're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. The bride is. Sure she is. Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 says so. That they sit on thrones... And Jesus is going to be sitting on thrones. But then there's a scripture in Revelation chapter 1. Maybe we can read that one. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 1.
verse 5. I'll start there. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, begotten of the resurrected ones to be raised, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, in his own blood by one sacrifice. And he has made us. That's you and me. Not just you and I, but all those that would be in the bride. He has made us kings and priests unto God, his Father. So the second person has a father. <laughs> We're not speaking Trinitarian. Unto God, which is the great eternal spirit that's in and operating through Jesus Christ. He has made us kings and priests unto, unto God and his Father. And to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now. I have to probably go back. If that chart's... Uh, Yeah, this one will do probably. Now, during when Jesus came on earth, he was a prophet or the, or the apostle of our faith. The apostle, not just a apostle. But when he died on the cross of Calvary, His function changed. And he became high priest. High priest between you and I and our Heavenly Father. And he functioned as that high priest faithfully. Still is because the seventh seal is not broken. And so he's been high priest for almost 2,000 years. But he has not, during that great age, operated as kings of kings. Has he? Yet, in the Old Testament, talks about him being also the kings of kings and lords of lords and being a high priest. That was imputed to him to be that. In the fullness of time when he would be his priesthood, he would be that priest for 2,000 years of time. But one day he'll... In heaven, from the throne, he takes that scroll of redemption. In 1963, he peels six seals. I'm glad he stopped. What does that tell me? Father, I do nothing except what you show me. Not because of what I like to do. I'm not a vending machine for people's ideas and promotions and so forth. So in 1963, six seals was revealed. He still has that scroll in his hand. But not too far up the road from us, he's going to take that seventh seal and peel it back. When he does, he will no longer be high priest again. Not in a function that's functioning as a priest. Now his priesthood that he's been for 2,000 years is still accredited to him. Because he's been that. It's just like a man that's working. He's a carpenter for 20 years. Then he decides to go to school, a trade school and he wants to be an electrician so he gets his electrician license. Well, yes, he's been a carpenter. But now he's working as an electrician. He can still do some carpentry work, but he's not do that's not what he's doing. So now when that seventh seal is broke, that high priest position is over. There's a transitional space of time which is called the week of Daniel. But when he, the, in heaven, before we come, the saints are going to crown him kings of kings and lords of lords. We're going to throw our crowns at him <laughs> because he's worthy. So when he comes to the earth and he sits in that temple, 
His main function is going to be kings of kings. He's going to be ruling. He won't be doing the high priest function, although he's a representation of that. All right? Now, to you and I, according to this scripture, you're standing right before the millennium. He's looking at the whole grace age. He has made us kings and priests, not just you and I in this generation, but all those that would be in the bride from the, when he went up on high till this hour. So he's made the bride kings and priests. And for, now we, don't, we haven't lived 2,000 years ourselves, but all the bride that would be living during that grace age function as priests. Did you function as kings in this grace age? Are we functioning as king this morning? No. But we are going to be. Just like Jesus. So what? Do we offer animal sacrifice in this hour? Mm -mm. The sacrifice of praise from your lips and your life offered to God, that's our priest's function as far as God is looking at it from us concerning Him in that spirit realm where He lives. He loves to hear from His children. Are we seeing the picture? Now, we've come, all the bride is accumulated is in heaven. Jesus, well, what, not all in heaven. Sorry, let me rephrase that. When He peels that seventh seal... There's a little time on earth till we are dealt with. Because we're going to, when that seventh seal is peeled, how many of you know we're going to be praying like never we never prayed before? If you want to put your priesthood to, to the function, that's when it's going to happen, brothers and sisters. More, more than ever. But then when we are changing the twinkle of an eye and we go up to heaven, you have prayed your last prayer. Your life is complete. You have your resurrected body. So you won't be functioning as priests after you have your resurrected body and you're in heaven. Now we take that and as we come to the earth with the Lord Jesus Christ, He sits on thrones and the bride sits on thrones. Ruling and reigning. And like I mentioned last... Thursday. Uh, let's see. I know it's in here somewhere. Oh, here. So this represents in the millennium. Jesus is going to be kings of kings and lord of lords. Yes, he's going to sit in that temple. Yes, there's going to be animal sacrifice in Jerusalem. But the nations is going to come there once a year. The sheep that are there will come to see a natural animal sacrifice in, near where that temple is so that they could witness how awful the suffering that he that sits in that temple had to pay for you and I and for them. They're looking back to Calvary. Us, we look towards Calvary. Well, we look back, but we look to what Jesus is doing now. So now as... And that's the only place where there's to be doing animal sacrifice. The bride has never done animal sacrifice here on earth that I know of from the la during the grace age. Have you? Maybe there might be some things I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Don't know everything. So I, I just put the point across. So we haven't done that. But we did offer by the sacrifice the praises of our lips. Now picture yourself, you're in the millennium now. God has seen that we're going to, we move from priesthood into kingship. Ruling and reigning. You're not going to be offering praises and uh, uh, so forth and to God. It's already been done. You are complete. You're ruling and reigning. You're in another function. You're functioning as kings. But... 
in Revelation chapter 20, if we want to go there now. Verse 4, it says, I saw thrones. That's you and I, the bride of Jesus Christ. That sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. Now it goes on to another aspect. It says, I saw souls of them that were beheaded. You and I haven't been beheaded. Most of the saints, have, bride has not been beheaded, but some have, but in the past. So I saw them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast. That's in that week of Daniel. That's ahead. And neither had received his, received his mark upon their forehead or in their hand. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So these are going to reign. These are going to have resurrected bodies because they're dead. They're up in heaven. But when the, when the millennium starts, they're coming back. And they'll have their resurrected bodies. But the rest of the dead live not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. It is the third part. I'm looking at white robes. Yes, it's using this tribulation period as a type really represents the other white robes in one sense of what's going to be taking place. Blessed is he that has part in the first resurrection. Blessed are those, I'll put it this way, that have part in the third part of the res first resurrection. I'll leave that one there. On such the second death has no power, and they shall be priests, not kings, of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So you and I are going to be sitting on thrones, and our work, occupation, is going to be kingship, ruling. Now, if you want to know what kingship and ruling, if this is confusing for you, it's like an empire that has a main head, and he's got governors in different sections of the area. They're ruling and reigning in their, in their area under the headship of the one that overall. So Jesus is the one that's overall. He's the Lord of lords and the kings of kings. He's the Lord of lords and the kings of kings. He's the kings of king of us, too, because we're kings. And he's going to be our king. He's going to be king, king. Uh, okay, slow down. He's going to be the king over us as well as the kings of the nations. He's king of everything. And Lord of Lords, too. Lords, I can see that as being those of the white robes. But let's, I um, don't want to go too far in there. But these shall reign as priests. Now since in Ezekiel chapter 43 it talks about how animal sacrifice is going to be instituted in the millennium in Israel by your Jewish elements because that's where the nations go to once a year to witness this or the representation or whatever however it's going to unfold but what are these white robes going to be doing as priests they'll be priests in this manner the sheep that are in there in the millennium as they come in to have problems, they'll be the means to be the front lines we want to, to bring in things that is going to be required, on, and they're working on their behalf as priests. They'll be, and because God has a certain order in His fam, in the whole situation, in His plan, I can see these priests bringing it up to those that are ruling in their area. Then the rulership, which is the bride, deals with it, or, or if it's something that needs immediate requirement, it goes to Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So these priests, these white robes that are going to be op operating as peace, pr priests, are not going to be doing animal sacrifice. But be there to bring 
the praises of the lips of those sheep subjects. Root it up through to where he needs to go. Is that okay? Because otherwise there are going to be a whole lot of animal slaughtering by these priests if it is the actual physical offering in the millennium. And these white robes have resurrected bodies. They'll be working with the millennium subject directly. Now time is... All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for all you've done for us, Lord. Lord, use the words that were spoken as you would see fit. Lord, give us traveling mercy on the highway. And Lord, bless my brothers and sisters, I pray. In Christ Jesus' name I ask. Amen.